For our next plenary, our second moderator, to finish his Doctor of Medicine and Master's in Public Health in Ateneo de Zamboanga University School of Medicine. He took his Master's in Healthcare Administration at St. Jude Colleges. He's a fellow in Philippine College of Hospital Administrators. He's currently a Medical Officer for in the City Health Office of Zamboanga and a Muslim COVID Death Coordinator. He's also a facility manager in Ecozone Isolation Facility and pursuing his Arabic language and Islamic studies in Mahad Abdiya. No other than Dr. Hussein Sahijuan III. Faleta Faddal, Fadilat Humashkura. Jazakamullahu khairat, Dr. Sain al Abidin Nuruddin for that uh, generous introduction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan. It is with great honor to be invited as one of the moderators for this first Islamic medical conference entitled Medicine in Islam, Medical Practice, and Islamic Medical Ethics. Now let me introduce to you our first speaker on organ donation and transplantation. Our speaker finished his Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery at Medical School, University of Tripoli in Libya has a master's degree in business administration at business school university of hall in united kingdom he is a fellow of the royal college of physicians of london he is a member of the royal college of physicians of edinburgh the british renal association also a member of european dialysis and transplantation association international society of nephrology american society of nephrology and currently a consultant transplant nephrologist at King Fahad Specialist Hospital in Dammam, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Let me welcome Dr. Khalid Bilid Akari. Dr. Khalid. Hi, assalamu alaikum. Um, Okay, now that gets rid of the echo. And that shares the screen. Dr. Khalid, we can't hear you. Sorry. Hey, can you hear me now? Can you hear me, can now? You hear me now? Yes, uh, yes, doc. Yeah? Yeah? Yes, doctor. You may take doctor, doctor. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you um, for the, um, to the organizers for the uh, invitation. And uh, thank you, Doctor, for uh, a very, very generous and kind introduction that uh, I'm not sure I, uh, I deserve all that. But uh, so it's nice to... Uh, to uh, to talk to uh, fellow colleagues and uh, brothers and sisters um, about a, um, the field of organ transplantation and uh, donation. So our journey today, I mean, it's, it is a big topic and um, all being well, we'll, we'll have an overview. Um, we'll start with an introduction about end organ failure around the world, the size of the problem. Um, introduce you to the concept of organ transplantation, the benefits of organ transplantations, the survival advantage in particular that organ transplantation confers to the patients. Then we'll touch on the practicalities of organ transplantations and we'll give you a glimpse of what a, trans a potential transplant recipient goes through in the way of um, evaluation. And um, issues about organ donor pools, uh, assessment, both deceased and uh, living. And again, leave you with, um, uh, leave you to ponder about the uh, challenges that the field of organ transplantation uh, is facing. So um, it is now, it has been known for, for quite a while now that the uh, life expectancy of people around the world 
uh, has been on the rise. And, um, you know, over the last 50 years or so, um, if you look at all over the world, uh, the life expectancy uh, of people have been going up. And it's not really um, limited to one region of the world. You know, um, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the and the uh, and North America, uh, the life expectancy of people is going up, improving. That comes with implications. The implication being that uh, we now have more people who are living to older age, and therefore these people. Um, it follows also that these people are, uh, or a lot of these people are living with um, remnants of chronic diseases and uh, failing organs, even if it is not an in-stage failure, but failing organs nonetheless. The implication of that is that um, the medical field and the way and how it approaches uh, this group of the population, um, it's really by relieving their suffering and treating their symptoms um, and uh, to the degree possible, trying to render them functional and independent again. And when possible, and when, it's, when it becomes necessary to uh, replace their uh, failing organ or their failed organ function, that obviously um, you know, is done to various degrees because the, rena the um, replacement of function of failing organs you know, is it, really a spectrum. It goes from um, um, controlling their symptoms and alleviating the suffering to actually trying to replace, even in part, the function of the failed organ, the example being the kidneys. So one way of replacing the, kid the, the kidney function is by doing something uh, like dialysis. But when possible, also is replacing that organ by doing an organ transplant. This is to give you an idea, by way of example, um, of the size of the problem that the world faces uh, with in stage renal failure. So that is kidneys that are at in stage failure. Um, this is the annual incidence, that's the um, number of people joining the end-stage renal failure group per million population in various countries. And if you look here, uh, you get Turkey here, you've got Egypt, uh, you get Malaysia here, you get uh, India, you get Tunisia here, and many, and many countries. So, you know, it goes from a country like Taiwan, uh, where uh, over 400, um, around 410 uh, per million population, new patients join the in-stage renal failure group. Uh, to in Egypt, it's around 200 uh, per million population. So this is an ever uh, increasing number of patients. And this, and we're lucky in, in uh, when it comes to kidneys because there is a way of dealing with this uh, with in stage kidney failure other than transplant, which is basically by putting them on dialysis. This is something that is not available for us uh, in, in, in other organs, for instance, like the heart. Um, again, as an indicator of the size of the problem uh, across the world. So if you look here, this is the prevalence, that is the percentage of the population that have a degree of kidney failure. Kidney failure is stage from stage one to five. So per age group. So these are the age groups here, groups so 20, 29, 30, 39, 40, 49, to over 70s. And in percentage terms, it goes from a 6% in the younger age group to around 28% uh, in the older age groups. So as, um, as people grow older, the, pre the prevalence of uh, chronic kidney disease of its various stages, one to five, increases. But on average, across the population, you're talking about around 10 to 11 percent. And if you if you translate that into millions, into absolute number of patients, uh, you're talking about um, just under half a half a billion, so 500 million uh, in the world uh, suffer from a degree of kidney failure, one to five. So it's a significant condition. That's by way of example. If you um, 
home into a single country, like in Saudi Arabia in 2019, there were uh, over 19,000 hemodialysis patients. So around, on, in, in all, on dialysis in Saudi Arabia in 2019, there were over 20,000 people who are on permanent, on regular dialysis. The number of people on transplant are kind of stayed static, uh, living with transplant are just over 700. You can see the gap, you know, from from 19,000 or 20,000 to 7,000. That's a gap. There's a lot of people who are on dialysis who cannot get an organ. Again, just to show you that uh, even when we are able to provide, um, you know, a replacement function for the failed organ, like in the case of the kidneys by doing chronic dialysis, a lot of people don't know that actually being on chronic dialysis is um, carries quite a significant um, 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 mortality. Um, the overall mortality is around per year is around nine percent. But this slide just sh shows you that the actually five year survival of people on dialysis uh, at times is actually much worse than some cancers. So the five year uh, long term dialysis here, and this is Italian data, um, is around 55% five-year survival overall. Um, compare that to cancers like colon cancer or kidney cancer or types of lymphomas or even breast cancer. Okay, So having an end-stage um, organ failure, even when you are able to provide a replacement by dialysis, carries quite a significant mortality. The primary, um, you know, if you take kidney uh, disease, the primary causes of kidney failure around the world hasn't really changed much over a period of the last 10 years or so. Diabetes is still high in the risk, uh, high in the list there. You get hypertension, you've got uh, types of uh, glomerulonephritis, that's inflammation of the kidneys. So suffice to say, diabetes is the dominant uh, cause. Okay, when somebody's or um, when an organ fails and reaches an end stage failure, what are the options? Well, the options, you know, that we treat the symptoms, ameliorate the uh, suffering, improve the function and functional and functionality of that of that person, um, and when possible, replace the function of that organ. Now we replace it either by a mechanical device, like uh, you know, it's done for the heart uh, to a degree, although it's not widespread. Um, for the kidneys, it's done by permanent dialysis. Um, but when possible, it's with an organ transplant. We replace the organ. So in the case of incision failure, we transplant the kidney. In the case of liver, uh, liver cirrhosis or the cancer of the liver, biliary atresia, uh, liver is transplanted, type 1 diabetes, you get a pancreas transplant, terminal heart failure, you get a heart, and so on. This slide shows you the uh, shows you a milestone of the uh, um, the journey of organ transplantation in the world. Um, you know these are the first successful uh, um, transplants in the world. It goes from the uh, cornea, beginning of uh, last century, to the uh, transplanting of kidneys uh, between twins, and then the diseased organ. Uh, kidney transplant, then came the liver, the heart, until we got to a face transplant in uh, 2010. Transplant is a uh, of an organ is a journey. So if you think about it, when a uh, an organ, uh, be it a heart, a liver, a kidney, or thereabout, um, becomes dysfunctional, and it progresses in its deterioration, it, and it becomes uh, it reaches to an end-stage organ failure. You either treat the symptoms, but also when you can't replace the therapy um, by doing dialysis or doing mechanical uh, heart support. Um, but at the same time, if you evaluate the patient for possible transplant, and there are criteria there, and we'll talk about them later. Uh, so if they're not, um, if they're medically, they're not a candidate, then. Uh, that will be just basically treating the symptoms and ameliorate the suffering. But if they are an organ transplant candidate, 
and there is an organ available, then they get transplanted. Transplant then is a journey where they can live with, an, uh, with a function in transplant. Obviously, it will entail taking medication to suppress the immune system in order to tolerate the organ, multiple clinic visits, regular, and uh, tests and even admissions at times. So what I'm trying to say right to the end of their life. So what I'm trying to say here is from being transplanted, um, transplant is not a cure. Organ transplant is not a cure. Is is another mode of treatment. It happens to be the best mode of treatment when it's available uh, and it's possible. But it's not a cure per se, even between twins. Like uh, a through this journey, they, can, they may suffer complications. So the organ may start to dysfunction or start to reject, or they may have infections, or may, they may suffer from cardiovascular disease, uh, which is one of the dominant causes of death in, uh, in, in, in organ transplant patients. Um, and also secondary malignancies. So sometimes they suffer from this complication, they get treated and they get back to a function in transplant, um, or, that um, that organ dysfunction may continue to deteriorate until they get to another state of end stage, and then again you repeat the cycle again. Um, so there are people who get transplanted more than once. Organ transplantation generally improves the quality of life of the uh, uh, of the patient and increases life expectancy of patients with end stage organ failure. That's a general statement. Um, this is some data from New England Journal of Medicine back in the uh, 1999. 1999. It again shows a survival advantage of people who get transplanted over people who remain on dialysis. So uh, through all the age groups, uh, both sexes, races, um, and regardless if you're diabetic or otherwise. So this is the annual death rate. So if you take a group, say the 40 to 59, uh, the annual death rate there is around 13% in this group of people if they remained on um, dialysis, while if they get a kidney transplant, the annual rate of death is around 4%. So it's um, around um, it's around the third uh, of what it what it would be if they remained on dialysis. Um, again, this slide shows the survival, the patient survival uh, advantage um, if you get a kidney transplant uh, versus if the person remained on dialysis. And this is a 14-year data. So say after six years, this much, so around 85% of people on dialysis are alive, while this figure is close to 90%. Uh, and over in the high 90s for people who get transplanted. So survival advantage right from early on, and it's uh, it's true even up to 14 years in this study. The survival after kidney transplant has improved uh, as we improved our techniques and our medication. So people who were transplanted in, eight, in the 80s, uh, that's their five-year survival curve here. Compare that with those transplanted in the 2010s. So the survival there uh, of more recent transplants is much better. We got better at it. This is data from uh, the US. Again, um, whether you're, um, this is patient survival, this is graft survival, that's the kidney, that's the transplanted kidney survival. And again, in, uh, in, in recent years, our results are better than what they used to be even in the 1990s. So we're getting better outcomes. Heart transplant, this is 10-year um, data, but if you look at five years, the survival there is over 70% after a heart transplant. For a liver, and this is deceased donor liver transplant, after five years, uh, around 85% of people are still alive. It's important, however, that uh, the survival advantage that a kidney transplant confers um, is, is, um, comes after, after a while, especially if, you, if you're talking about deceased organ transplants. So this is again from the New England uh, paper about deceased donor transplantation in the late 1990s. So, if zero time is the time of the transplant, this is a person who got a kidney transplant from a diseased uh, donor. 
decay from a brain dead donor. Now, they're initially, when they first transplanted, the risk of death actually increases to nearly threefold just immediately after the surgery. And that risk comes down gradually. Okay, in this group, it took around 106 days for the risk to go back to what it was under, uh, under dialysis. This is for this group of patients in this study. Now, obviously, this period of time uh, may be shorter uh, if the recipient of the, uh, of the transplanted organ are younger and are fitter. So instead of 106 days, it may be 90 days, maybe 80 days, right? But after that, after in this group and in this study, after 106 days, the survival advantages is clear. Uh, so the risk of death uh, with a transplant organ is less than that of the, uh, if they remained on dialysis. Um, well, if transplant is so great, why, why aren't we doing more of it? Well, part of the problem is really the availability of organs. This is data from the Saudi uh, Renal Registry, the Scott Anwar report from 2019, so that's before COVID. So if you look, this is the number of people who are on uh, hemodialysis. Um, and these are the people who are on the transplant list. So around only 16% of people who are on dialysis are actually on the transplant list. So less than a fifth, one in five, less than one in five are actually in the transplant list. So there is a gap between people who require, who are um, in end-stage renal failure uh, and people who are actually on the transplant list. And even these people who are on the transplant list don't think that they'll, they're gonna be transplanted tomorrow because of the non-availability of organs actually the, um, this is data from the US and this is the median waiting time for a kidney transplant, um, you know, around 50, um, around 50 months. Um, in this country is around five years basically and it varies between blood groups, but on average is around five years. For the liver, the waiting list uh, in the US, uh, sorry, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Eurotransplant group is going up. So the number of liver transplants hasn't really changed much, but the number of people waiting for a liver transplant is going up. And there is a gap between the number transplanted and the number who are waiting for a transplant. Um, this is transplant waiting list in the US. Again, quite a significant number of people, over 12,000 people waiting for a liver transplant. For the heart, again, this is US data. Now, over 3,000 people waiting for a heart transplant. What are the barriers for organ transplantation? Well, there are many barriers for organ transplantation. Um, not least logistic barriers uh, and resource barriers. So you have to be able to actually do it. And it is not about a transplant physician, with all due respect, and it's not about transplant surgeon, again, with all due respect to our surgical colleagues. Um, it's really a transplant team. And um, transplant work is really multidisciplinary per excellence. Um, so you, you have to have a team. You cannot build it on an individual. It, it, it won't work. And as we proceed, you will, you will, you will see why. Other barriers, uh, medical barriers, um, you know, a relation to the transplant, uh, to the transplant recipient, the, the patient who needs the transplant, it's really the degree of fitness. So not every person who suffers from end-stage organ failure are fit uh, to actually have a transplant because um, you've got, number one, you've got the transplant surgery, which is, um, you know, a major surgery. It's not a minor surgery. It's a major surgery, whether they will be able to tolerate that or not, number one. Number two, um, they may have uh, a lot of comorbidities, um, that actually limit their survival, even if they get a successful transplant. So, you know, the good news is, okay, you had a transplant, but the bad news is the rest of the body is failing because of multiple comorbidities. And therefore, that person will not live uh, long, even after a kidney transplant, um, for instance. Um, other sort of barriers are to do with the donor of the organ to be transplanted, is the availability of the donor. 
There are issues about consent, whether it's deceased donor or living donor. We'll talk about that later. The fitness of the donor and suitability of the donor. Not every uh, everybody who comes forward as a potential donor is accepted as an organ donor. And then there is donor care in the ICU setting, especially you know, with the uh, deceased donors. Um, last, again, under medical is really the uh, the, uh, uh, the match between the donor and the recipient, be it the uh, blood group match or the tissue match. But you see that I've left that right to the end because um, you know we have solutions for this, but the medical fitness and the availability of the organ uh, or the availability of the donor is a bigger issue. Um, Transplant recipient evaluation. Well, um, it's quite detailed. I said it's multidisciplinary, so it's, uh, um, from the medical evaluation by you know transplant physician, transplant uh, surgeon. There is a transplant coordinator. There is a social worker. There is a psychologist. There is a clinical pharmacist. There is an immunologist, um, the lab test, and the detailed imaging. The aim of the transplant recipient evaluation. Is to, is to establish that the candidate is well enough to tolerate transplant surgery and is likely to benefit post-transplant. In other words, uh, they're likely to, to, uh, to enjoy the, um, uh, the fruits of the transplant in terms of quality of life uh, and in terms of survival. But here, um, quality of life you know, it is, is a matter of perspective. In other words, uh, what, what constitutes a good quality of life or an acceptable quality of life for me and you may be different from how the patient sees it or how the family sees, sees it. So, you know, quality of life, but who's to say? You know, who's to judge what a, what's a good quality of life? Again, uh, the time post kidney transplantation, that is the survival of the transplant recipient after uh, transplantation. That's also something to think about. Uh, and I'm going to throw these as questions because these are questions that we face every day when we do transplant work. So, you know, there is no, there is no age limit per se um, for being a transplant recipient. Um, now we transplant people in their eight, um, even in, in, in the late 70s and occasionally even um, in the early 80s. But obviously these people are um, have to be super fit and there are a lot of thinking that goes on uh, around that. Like in, even if you take somebody who's in the um, mid 60s, like 65, um, well, what's their survival? What's their expected survival? You know, uh, without a transplant. Well, without a transplant, if you take the, um, the example of the kidney, the expected survival is around four or five years. Uh, with a transplant, you may add another two years for that. So all in all, that kidney you transplanted is going to serve for six years. Well, if you took that kidney from a deceased, uh, from a deceased donor, that same kidney could have gone to a younger patient and would have functioned there for 20 years, not six years, 20 years. Or if you took that kidney from a living donor, uh, say of age 30, uh, and then that kidney survived for only six years because the patient dies of natural causes. So you took that kidney from somebody who is age 30, who was expected, who, who is expected to live to the age of you know, um, 75 or so, you took it at the age of 30, you gave it to somebody else, okay, who needs it, but that kidney only served for six years because the patient dies of natural causes. So is this, is this acceptable? So suffice to say that the time and the length of time and after transplant and the quality of life uh, can be quite subjective. Um, so age mismatch again. Okay. So going back to the age mismatch. So we, we, we face situations where basically a 20 year old or even 18 year old, because that's the legal age for 
consent in this country. So uh, somebody who's age 18 comes and wants to donate a kidney to a father or a mother who's age, say, um, 67 or 70. Right, well, you know what I said now about the expected survival of that recipient and um, the fact that now this donor, living donor, is going to live with one kidney uh, to the age of 75, because that's the expected, uh, uh, that's the life expectancy uh, at birth in this country now. So it's a question uh, of judgment here that we have to struggle with every day. Again, you've got the issue of comorbidity, so we're dealing more and more of recipients who are marginal, i.e. who are overweight, have diabetes, have a bit of heart disease, you know, multiplicity, multiplicity of comorbidity. There are people who come with history of non-adherence to, to, to treatment. You know, how do you deal with those? Uh, do you say, well, you're not transplantable at all if you're, if you're non-adhering to your treatment before the transplant? Expanding the, uh, the, uh, uh, the organ pool. So from disease donor, um, there are two types of uh, disease donors. Uh, there is donation after brain death. So that's brain stem death. And there is donation after cardiovascular death. So um, they're also known as uh, beating heart and non-heart beating uh, donors. There, there are specific definitions for, the, uh, uh, for brain death. Um, and um, th these have to be satisfied before a, a donor is, a, is accepted. For the circulatory death, donor, there are different categories, um, you know, they go from uh, dead on arrival, this, this is the Maastricht uh, categorization, um, to death um, after uh, unsuccessful resuscitation. But there are also types of uh, cardiac death or cardiovascular death uh, that are planned. The example of that is bad um, you know, brain injury. So. Uh, victims of accidents that come with very bad uh, head injury that are uh, incompatible with life. This uh, master categorization has been modified, modified several times. Now, the deceased donor, well, first of all, there is the legal stipulations, whether the law of the land allows that or not, and what are the diagnostic criteria for uh, to diagnose brain death. Uh, so that's somebody who's uh, uh, un unconscious without any sedation, who cannot breathe on their own, so they are on a ventilation machine, and who satisfies certain uh, brainstem uh, test uh, criteria, and also uh, a confirmation by an EEG and uh, a cerebral angiogram. There is a question of consent. Uh, there is here the donor card. Um, the deceased donor may be a donor car carrier and if they are a donor car carrier does the family have a veto on that or not or is it final if i'm a donor carrier and i happen to suffer a uh, from an incident does my family have a uh, a veto over my wish uh, by being a donor carrier there is also the opt in opt out to the to the donor list um, so I can, you know, countries in the world are different. So if you go to Spain, it's an opt-out. So everybody who dies is a potential donor in a country like Spain, unless they opted out, unless they said during their life that they do not want to be an organ donor. So you have to opt out, not opt in. If you take a country like Saudi Arabia, no, it's an opt in. I have to say that I want to be a donor during my lifetime. Um, obviously, by being an opt uh, out, Spain has basically uh, um, completely uh, 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 vanished its, uh, wait, uh, its uh, waiting list. The aim in the evaluation or under consideration of a uh, deceased organ uh, donor is really to um, ensure that their organ to be transplanted is of a decent quality uh, for it to be transplanted and also uh, there are considerations for risk of transmission of 
uh, infections and uh, malignancy. So this is uh, about uh, brain death. As I said, a uh, patient is unconscious, without any sedation, no brainstem reflexes, and uh, on, on a ventilator. But these tests here are quite detailed and have to be done in a certain way, and they differ from one country to another. In addition to confirmatory tests by doing uh, a brainwave recording and an angiogram. Types of uh, uh, DCDs, that is uh, cardiovascular death uh, patients. Again, this is modified Maastricht. The rule there is basically the decision to withdraw cardiorespiratory support when we're dealing with uh, cardio. Uh, cardiosarcolatinate death. The rule is that the decision to withdraw the cardiorespiratory support should be independent of that uh, of organ donation. There are two separate things done by two different teams independently. Controversy again uh, to do with the uh, deceased donor after cardiac death. Um, Controversy exists really about the time that should elapse after cardiac arrest or unsuccessful cardiac arrest uh, for death to be declared. Um, there's a rule of thumb there that's around five minutes have to elapse of continuous uh, cardiorespiratory arrest that is basically a flat line or a systole uh, before um, organ retrieval can start. The WHO has issued a critical pathway for organ donation, be it a donation after brain death or after circulatory death. The practice uh, around deceased organ donation around the world is quite variable. As you see in a country like Spain, the rate of donation is quite high. It's around 30 per million. These are uh, brain, uh, brain death donors. Um, they they do little of uh, little of uh, circulatory death. Compare that to the UK, um, where the rate of the brain death disease donors is around 10 per million, and they do more of the uh, circulatory death. And even countries where uh, who where circulatory death um, or donation after circulatory death is uh, legal like the UK and Australia, the practice is different in terms of the frequency of it. And that's, again, it's quite noticeable here that, uh, you know, the UK does more of deceased uh, donor um, organ retrieval after cardiovascular death compared to, say, Australia. Uh, but it's noticeable that the uh, number of ICU beds available in in Australia is around 70 per million, while in the UK is around 27 per million. So circulatory uh, death or donation after circulatory death, what happens is if it is uncontrolled, if it is unexpected cardiac arrest, um, so there is the arrest there, there is the, uh, the attempt to resuscitate uh, that if that tends to be unsuccessful or deemed unsuccessful, then there is a no touch period uh, where you're not allowed to, to, to touch the patient or retrieve the organs. Uh, after that period elapses, uh, then the procedure for organ preservation and uh, retrieval can start. Now, uh, that's obviously presuming that this is a cons uh, that there is a consent uh, to, 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 uh, for this patient or for this person to, to donate. If it is controlled, like the example I gave of a bad head injury uh, that is incompatible with life without cardiorespiratory support, so that is under control. So there's a withdrawal of uh, life support measures here. This is different from brain. This is somebody with cardiorespiratory uh, support who are no brain dead, but who are, have severe brain injury that's uh, incompatible with life. So in countries where this is legal, like the UK, they can withdraw the treatment here, and then over a period of time, the blood pressure drops, and they gradually they get into a flat line, and there is a waiting period from uh, start of flat line 
um, before they start organ preservation and retrieval. For a living donation, to try to expand the donor uh, pool, we went now to do a, a, a blood group incompatible or tissue or HLA incompatible transplants. Um, we have the living unrelated and the undirected donors. This is an attempt to expand the donor team. And also in the last years, we've been doing do donor uh, exchanges. Um, the assessment of a living donor, uh, again, it's a medical assessment to see whether they're fit, uh, they're not terribly overweight, they don't have diabetes or cardiac disease, things like that, seen by a donor coordinator, uh, social worker, psychologist, uh, donor advocate, also you know, a series of lab tests and uh, imaging. Again, is to try to establish that the candidate is well enough to tolerate the donor surgery and that they, uh, they will be able to live normally thereafter, from the medical point of view, a quality of life. Um, key to this is, is the question of consent. Um, increasingly, you know, we're dealing with marginal donors, um, donors where the weight, uh, where the weight is up, um, they're more than ideal, they're overweight or even at times touching on the obese, BMI more than 24 or BMI more than 30, um, the age mismatch. And also there are people who come with pre-diabetic state, a tendency to develop that. They're not diabetic at the moment, but they have a tendency to develop diabetes later or marginal in terms of blood pressure. And there are also people with subtle uh, urine exam findings. The question here, other than, uh, you know, the living donor passing the the surgery, the donor surgery, which again is a major surgery, it's really the long-term outcome for these, and in particular, the risk of end-stage renal disease uh, after kidney donation. So this slide here shows the 15-year projected uh, chance of end-stage kidney failure per age group. This is before donation. So if you look at somebody who's 20, the risk of uh, uh, developing end-stage kidney failure in in over the last 15 years is less than 0.1%. For somebody who's 60, um, the risk is less than 0.4%. So the risk is quite quite low. This is before, uh, before donation. If you look at, this is a 15 year risk. While if you look at the projected lifetime risk of somebody to develop end stage kidney failure over their lifetime, if you look at somebody who's 20, their lifetime risk is 1.6%. Somebody who's 60 and survived so far without uh, kidney failure, the risk during the remaining of their life is around 0.6%. Now, these risks here, so the risk of in-stage kidney failure is in the general population is low. The lifetime risk is low. However, after donation, you have to uh, multiply this by factor of three or even five. So compared um, with if I don't donate, my risk of my lifetime risk of end stage renal failure goes uh, fivefold. So it's not without risk. Um, the practice of uh, living donation around the world, Saudi Arabia is one of the one of the top countries in the rate of living donor uh, or living kidney donation, uh, around 30 per million. You've got Jordan here, you've got Iran here. Uh, people, uh, countries where um, there isn't much of disease organ donation tend to rely, and there are transplant programs, tend to rely on uh, uh, living donation. Um, this is, again, the proportion of living uh kidney donation as compared to all transplants. Again, if like in a country like Egypt, where disease donation is not permitted, they live 100% on living donation. Five minutes, yeah, okay. Right, parent exchange. So uh, donor and the recipient, they're not compatible. A donor and the recipient are not compatible. So what happens? Uh, this recipient either looks for another donor or now they can exchange their donor 
with this recipient. So this is a recipient, they're not compatible with their donor. This is another recipient, not, not compatible with, with their donor, but they can exchange. So this can donate to this recipient and this to this recipient. And it can be done for more than two pairs. So we've done it to seven pairs. So one pair, two pairs, three pairs, four, five, and six, and seven. In this center, we've done it to seven. Um, there is also the concept of undirected donors. So somebody who just say, I just want to donate to anybody. They can start a chain. So this is what we call a chain. Okay. And it may end up with somebody who's, uh, who was meant to donate to a particular recipient, but they're not compatible with them. Their recipient took a kidney from somebody else. So it's only fair that do they donate to somewhere else. So sometimes, uh, they can open yet another chain as big as this one or even bigger or go to the disease donor list. Finally, the challenges that, or some of the challenges that we face uh, daily as transplant physicians to do with the recipients, mostly really to do with the uh, marginal recipients. So people who are in extreme, um, who are older, people who are have multiple comorbidities, none of these comorbidities is basically a, a no-no for transplantation, but if you add one comorbidity to another, to another, to another, they add up, the risk end up. The consent, the um, donor organ quality, the challenge of perioperative risk, as we said earlier, that the, uh, the benefit of the deceased or organ transplantation may not reach the patient until, you know, 100 days or 90 days after. Question of non-adherence, life expectancy, that's again in transplanting people who are uh, quite old or with multiple comorbidity. Uh, the donor, it's really to do with quantifying and expressing the risk. So the quantifying and expressing the risk to the potential living donor of their lifetime risk of end-stage kidney disease, especially if they have, if they are a marginal donor. Uh, the consent here, um, Consent, if it is a deceased donor, does a card do? Or does a family have a veto? Um, like covert coercion um, between a, say, for instance, we see quite a lot of uh, children age 18 or 19 and 20 come in to donate to their, uh, you know, fathers and, and mothers. But uh, um, are they really making that decision uh, freely without coercion. Um, we go out of our way to try to um, keep them best informed uh, about what they can and what they can do. Uh, but in the end of the day, they have to come forward for to become donors uh, at their own free will. Thank you.